Welcome back. Okay, let's dive into some of the critical topics to accelerate the digital transformation. First up, we're gonna focus on using edge AI to modernize the grid and how to take data from a real smart AMI meter as one example um, and use it to make decisions more efficiently. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, EPRI fellow, Mark McGranigan, who's coming to us from our Ireland office to discuss IoT and Edge AI with NVIDIA, XL Energy, Amron, and Intel. Mark? Hey, thanks, Christine. That's great. And I hope everyone was able to join the opening session. It was a dynamite discussion led by Neil Wilmshurst, and I really enjoyed that. We're going to tackle uh, kind of a specific uh, focus of artificial intelligence at the edge of the grid with the huge opportunity for sensors and data and making use of that data to operate the grid better, plan the grid better, and provide benefits to customers. Just a huge number of use cases as we'll start to get into today. But, uh, you know, when you think about, we're scratching the surface now with advanced metering and, and starting to take advantage of advanced metering data, you know, with the 150 million customers in, in the United States, for instance, you can, you know, just get a feeling for the amount of data that's available and that we have to deal with just from advanced metering. But if we, we worked on a project with, with Eaton looking at an energy management circuit breaker and monitoring individual circuits in the house in, in, in real time and going down to individual devices like the smart lady from Amazon that's sitting next to me, so I can't say her name, but uh, the, just the, the number of sensors and availability of data is, is so large that, that we have to look at how we can take advantage of that data locally as much as possible, how we can, uh, you know, put intelligence close to where where the applications are and use central processing to to coordinate all that and and uh, make sense out of it and and develop those algorithms and approaches that we can then push back out to the edge so that's our discussion today is to talk about how we can make this work from an architecture point of view from a technology point of view and 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 what it means to move intelligence to the edge of the grid and what the challenges and opportunities look like to uh, to take advantage of that. we got a really dynamite panel here today to talk about that. And that logistically, the way we're going to do that is we're going to have each panelist give a short perspective um, on, on uh, where they see this going in terms of uh, the intelligence at the edge of the grid. We have Prithpal Kajuria, from uh, in, from Intel that will be opening that discussion. Mark Spieler from NVIDIA will, will provide another perspective from the technology providers that are enabling this intelligence. And then we'll have two perspectives from Brian Emmonson and Scott Hickson looking at use cases from the utility point of view, where we are now and how that fits into our vision for planning and operating the grid and providing customer benefits using that that edge intelligence. So feel free to throw questions at the Slido and uh, we'll be watching those and and uh, bring those up to the panelists for for discussion. So if you, you have specific questions for each panelist or general questions that you want us to discuss, uh, throw them in the Slido and, and we'll see if we can make those part of the discussion. We have our own questions for each other and, and topics that we'll want to uh, discuss after these initial perspectives. So with that, and I'll let him introduce his, his background, but Prithpal has been working in this space of edge intelligence for many years. Um, that And, and uh, appreciate all the way back to Silver Spring Networks when we were first developing the architectures and approaches for advanced metering. So. Um, Prithpal, we're going to give you the first shot at giving us a perspective here. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, nice to meet you all. You know, I'll, I'll share the view of it. Since the smart metering was done in early 2000 to where we are today with the emergence of uh, uh, microgrids. So what microgrids or distributed energy resources are leading to a emergence of a bi-directional grid. 
which is going to come with its own challenges and, and drivers. I think one of the biggest thing is happening, the distributed energy resources can change very quickly. They can go up and down very fast and we need to inject the same kind of reliability into the grid going forward. Uh, so in this scenario, what we are talking, we are talking about is that how the distributed energy resources are going to impact the grid and what technologies, utilities needed going forward uh, to enhance uh, their grid operations network. So what we're talking about here is that utilities were very data centric applications. In now going forward, we are going to move from a data centric infrastructure uh, data centric infrastructure to a edge centric infrastructure where the first phase will be to deploy the edge intelligence and the next phase is to start deploying the applications on the top of it aggregate normalize the data at the edge of the grid and extract the intelligence out of it for uh, greater visibility insight and faster decision making going forward what the grid infrastructure is going to look like is going to become a system of systems. Uh, the applications which are run in the data center will depend on what the actions are taken uh, in autonomous fashion in the substations with intelligent feeders or edge ADMS. That, that is kind of the evolution we are going to go through. So here is an example. How do we see is that grid modernization is going to happen? We learned a great when we did the smart metering infrastructure for the utilities. In the data we gathered, the insights we can get from the volt, volt war and other, other characteristics of the grid, the load variations. But in this case, we need to build an intelligent feeder to maximize the utilization of renewables at the edge of the grid which will lead to an intelligent feeder. From that intelligent feeder, all the compute or intelligence is stuck at, at the substation where all the data will be crunched, extracted, and the decisions will be made, and the, it will be notified to the control center. And for that, we need to digitalize both station bus and process bus in the substations going, going forward. So this is how we see is the infrastructure going to be happen going forward. What is going to be, we need to have a standardized hardware for the substations with software defined infrastructure on the top of it and then land all the applications for it. It's going to be same hardware with a little bit difference between the station bus and process bus, but it, but it will able to manage all those workloads with meet all the regulatory requirements to separate station bus from the process bus. So it will give the big benefits to the utilities. They don't have to buy hardware or products from five different vendors. Know what they have to do buy. They have to standardize, qualify, rugged servers for the substations. And after that is all become software defined easy to manage, maintain, secure going forward. Thank you very much for your time. Chris Paul, that, that was great. And I, I really like the perspective on the, the federated architecture. I kind of hear using edge intelligence to as an element of a overall intelligent feeder and coordinated with the substation as part of that system of systems concept. And I think uh, that's gonna be a very important concept for, for us to get our, our hands around. Why don't we go right to Mark Spieler and let him give us his perspective. Uh, and Mark, what do you, how do you uh, see this edge intelligence uh, affecting our, the way we, we operate and, and plan the electricity and energy systems? Thank you, Mark. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here today and, and to spend some time with EPRI and, and members. Um, I agree, you know, the grid is, is evolving and is being challenged in ways that we've never seen before. Um, I, I always like to start this off by 
these type of discussions off by just explaining why NVIDIA is at the table. Most most people think of NVIDIA as a gaming company, and and if if you don't have a son or a daughter that plays video games or mines cryptocurrency or we're fortunate enough to invest early. Um, people don't know that NVIDIA is actively involved in the energy space. Um, we've been actively involved for 20 plus years. And as AI becomes prevalent in different industries, especially energy, our role is increasing significantly. So really quick, I wanted to touch on some of the industries that <clears throat> AI is being leveraged in and think about how it's being leveraged at the edge and how that could be applicable to the energy grid and, and smart grids of the future. If we think about autonomous vehicles, right? The, the ability for vehicles to be trained to, to consume and be trained on so much information, typically it takes about 8 million miles to train an electric vehicle or an autonomous vehicle. And it needs to make split second decisions to keep people safe and it's doing that with, with a processor inside. And it has to be able to continue to do that even when not connected to a network, right? Telco's adopting AI for 5G rollouts, right? When you think about the need to get internet service and, and streaming capabilities into a stadium that has 70,000 people on a Sunday morning and have enough bandwidth for that, but then go back to normal after the game's over, very similar to what we're gonna see in the energy market with getting enough electricity to truck stops and those to charge trucks and semis, and then eventually move that electricity down the road to other locations. Uh, retail, last mile delivery, uh, real time at, at retail, and then uh, healthcare. Um, we're seeing some great innovation in healthcare where we're, we're seeing federated learning where actually hospitals and cancer institutions and universities are collaborating by not moving data, but actually sharing models, similar to what we do on smartphones today. And so if you look at the way that different industries are leveraging AI to solve those problems, we're gonna see very similar things with the increase in IoT and edge devices in the energy and electric utility space. Um, the industry's ripe for disruption. And you know, being in Texas, we saw some severe storms uh, earlier this year that, that caused millions of people without power. Um, we have um, preemptive blackouts in California and that due to vegetation management issues and concerns there. And as we increase the amount of distributed energy resources on the grid, we're gonna continue to see fluctuations in grid resiliency if we're not collecting a lot more data at the far edge. And what I would suggest is that the AMI and smart meters of yesterday are not going to be capable of collecting the amount of data behind the meter as well as in front of the meter with the increase in electric vehicles, uh, rooftop solar, and batteries that are going in right now. It, it's quite possible that these are going to create up to 10 gigabytes a day of data at each meter. And, you know, with given current communications, and the need to communicate between meter to meter, you're not gonna have the ability to move that data and to make those decisions in a way that are gonna be beneficial to everybody if we don't put more compute out at the edge. But once we do that, we're gonna see a tremendous amount of capabilities start to spring up across the grid where we're gonna be able to see downstream what the effects of electric vehicles plugging in at a, at a house will cause to substations and eventually all the way back to power generation plants. And although we've collected data throughout the years, it's never been at the resolution that's going to be needed to make sure that we have a strong and resilient grid. Recently, I was talking with a, a venture capital um, team that invests significantly in autonomous vehicles. And one of the things that they mentioned was investing in smart grid software companies moving forward because they saw the biggest risk to the adoption of electric vehicles being the grid's ability to charge them and, and, and manage that. And we, we at NVIDIA see that as a huge <clears throat> problem, uh, especially with the amount of investments that we've made in autonomous vehicles. And so we've started to invest in platforms, software platforms to help our partners and our customers 
to develop a smarter uh, smart meter and, and leverage an AMI platform that would be open for everybody, similar to that of an Android smartphone, right? How do we create an open environment for the industry that third parties can build on top of applications that can run on any smart meter from any smart meter or AMI providers in a way that takes the underlying uh, high resolution data feeds coming off of the, uh, the environment behind the meter and in front of the meter and can communicate to meter to meter so that when individuals in their houses or their businesses start to plug in these large amounts of electric vehicles, controls can be put in place to make sure that if five vehicles are being charged on the same uh, same street, that it can vary the charging to make sure that the um, transformers don't blow and that we can provide resilient energy to all of those people. And then all the way back to the intelligent substation and how, how we're gonna have to be able to create the microgrids um, that Prithpel described and be able to make real-time decisions to make sure that the grid is resilient. The technology is there and we're seeing it used a lot in other industries it's just how quickly we can get utility to start to take this on and build it. Just, just like Waze, I use Waze and it's an example. If you're stuck in traffic, you can either wait for them to build a new highway or you can look at the digital thing and reroute yourself to get to where you need to go faster. And I think this technology is gonna be needed and um, we're gonna work with companies to start to build out those platforms. So thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Great stuff, Mark. And you hit on a couple of points that I think are really important and we'll come back to them, especially uh, I think the whole topic of resiliency and the role of technologies at the edge of the grid uh, as part of the resiliency solution, particularly important. And uh, you mentioned the capability of the grid to to support our electrification goals as, as part of the decarbonization effort. and to really optimize investments associated with that is gonna take very intelligent um, management of these electrification loads, whether it's transportation or electrifying heating. Um, here in Ireland, it's it's huge as the grids are not built for air conditioning like mu much of the US grid is. You know, the grids are, are, you know, my house here, you know, has no air conditioning, no load that my electric vehicle is by far the largest load that I have at the house. So when when uh, everyone starts bringing those online, either we're going to have to rebuild the entire grid or we're going to have to do it very intelligently. So right on target. And I, that kind of is a good uh, segue to getting some utility perspectives um, directly. And, and Brian Amundsen has been involved in the uh, system planning and, and uh, smart grid applications at Excel for a number of years and in charge of grid modernization now. So Brian, why don't you uh, give us kind of the utility perspective on how we can make this work with grid intelligence? Well, thanks, Mark. Great discussions here. So today what I'd like to do is to take us down a path into a specific example uh, to help illustrate the concepts that we've talked about already today and that will be developed developed more thoroughly throughout the course of the conference here. So the uh, first thing I'd like to do is uh, talk to you about distributed intelligence at Excel Energy and what it means to us. Distributed intelligence which refers to the edge processing that we're building into our new AMI revenue meters. Uh, most of us are familiar with AMI, but let me just refresh that AMI or Advanced Metering Infrastructure is a system of communicating meters, uh, which come with a lot of capabilities. Normally they come with interval capabilities, whereas in the past we only had revenue uh, insight over the course of a month with AMI. Uh, more utilities got intervals of 60 minutes, 15 down to five minute intervals. And these intervals are specific, are very helpful uh, in, the, in the analysis. AMI meters are an incredible investment so we, a utility like ours with three and a half million customers is going to be um, investing hundreds of million of dollars into the meters. And we need to future-proof that investment uh, for the benefit of our customers. Meters are also great analog to digital sensors. So we need to leverage that. So the third thing to do then is simply to add 
well, I shouldn't say simply, but to add uh, computing process power on the meter. So a good processor, adding some memory, and then adding peer-to-peer -peer communication. Those things help to create a robust endpoint device. We heard a little bit about the uh, the needs for distributing the, the process uh, as referred to the uh, communication. Our bandwidth for our communication for our meters uh, is really limited. Uh, it, it not, not, it's very capable, but it does have a Wysun mesh and an LTE backhaul. And we need to have that capability, that bandwidth, when an event occurs, say a storm or so, that we can have a lot of information because tens of thousands of meters could be trying to communicate at the same time. So it's a robust communication network, but yet we heard about the magnitude of data that's going to be out there. We need to be able to uh, ensure that we have adequate bandwidth. Distributed processing absolutely helps us with that. A second element is persistence. A good uh, communication network needs to be persistent. It needs to be uh, incredibly high uptime, but a failure can occur. And we, the edge processing allows for decision-making to be taking place at the edge, for dis information to be flowing, uh, for that continuation of that compute processing. And then the third thing I wanna mention is that having edge processing enables timely action, local action. And how it can really help with us on that is, first off, an action could simply be providing information to a customer. Uh, and that's a great action in and of itself. But we can also invoke control actions. We'll talk about that a little bit more on the next uh, slide here. The third thing I wanna mention here is that my view is that centralized processing needs will actually grow and not decrease. Now there's gonna be a lot of computation out on the edge and that's good, but the ability of the centralized processing, whether it's cloud-based or back office, one can leverage the enhanced computing, computing power. Uh, one can use the machine learning and deep learning tools. One can input, you know, bring in more variables and inputs and really enhance that learning process. So the specific example that I'm going to talk about, I refer to as transformer load management. Uh, I think most everybody is familiar, but let me just uh, set the stage here that a distribution transformer, uh, which is in a suburban setting in the U.S., serves typically five to eight homes, uh, has a thermal limitation. It has a nameplate rating that is based on its thermal capabilities. Information in the past on how much load is impressed on that transformer has heretofore been done by uh, after the fact calculations using load profiles, diversity factors, utilities would calculate and uh, discern what size transformer they should put into a subdivision. And then when things really happened, like air conditioning, uh, compressive air conditioning came along, uh, things had to change. With electric vehicles, it's gonna change a lot and the utilities need to prepare for that. This is one of those means by which we can help do that. So then, Following the use of profiles, then AMI meters, you know, half of the nation now has interval metering or has AMI metering, which has most of it has interval capability. That allows the utility to get a far more accurate uh, insight as to what the load is. But the next phase is to get to the real time or at least near real time information. And that's where we're really talking about here with this edge computing process. With real time and near real time, it, action is enabled, and that's what's key here. The second thing I will mention is peer-to-peer -peer processing or peer-to-peer -peer communication. When the meters, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the total load impressed on the transformer is the sum total of the load on the customers that are served. Well, how can they know what that is unless they're communicating with each other? So the peer-to-peer -peer communication, in our case, it'll be done predominantly over PLC, but others might modes are possible, uh, power line carrier, I should say. It enables the uh, utilities to socialize their information and uh, a total load can be calculated compared against the rating of the transformer. And now we tru ha truly have some edge computing going on that's giving some really valuable insights. Then with that information, actions can be further biased and by the computation with additional insights. 
For instance, the transformer characteristic might be input into the system. Uh, local insights could be um, developed through disaggregation to know, are, is there an electric vehicle? Does the electric vehicle normally charge for only 45 minutes? Or perhaps it's through information coming from another source, uh, uh, more of a centralized source, such as weather insights, for, ins for, information, uh, for instance, uh, a long stretch of hot weather could be breaking and uh, rain and clouds are forecast that are going to abate the uh, heavy air conditioning load. And when that happens, then that local processing could take those information and make a decision that we're okay. Uh, we can last for a little bit longer. And then the last part on this slide here shows, that are we talking about centralized uh, processing can help validate, did we make right decisions? And then if uh, we are able, we could improve those algorithms for the future. That's one of the things that we always need to be mindful of with our AI thoughts is we need to have feedback coming in to help improve algorithms. Just mention real quickly, a few challenges. You, uh, it relies on a digital twin. The model accuracy is important. It's a hard, um, uh, key for utilities. Uh, but the second and third elements, I really want to speak to more. Uh, to make act intelligence actionable, yeah, especially as we're talking about controls, uh, we need to contemplate that we need rates and incentives for customers to agree upon this. So, and in the U.S., that means the uh, dialogue with the utility commissions and showing the business uh, and the, uh, the customer benefits of these propositions and putting out a rate that's attractive enough that uh, customers will continue on that. Then the third element, and we've spoken about this, and we heard about this in the opening session really well, is utilities really need to step up the game in understanding what is possible with AI, where we can go, and what uh, education we need to provide our, our uh, employees, um, and how to harvest this value. So those are the thoughts that uh, that I'm bringing forward, Mark, and I'm uh, ask uh, turn it back to you, Mark, and uh, thank you for your time, everyone. Brian, that's great, and I really appreciate you uh, digging into a specific example. It's actually one of the questions we had. You know, could you kind of look at a, a specific example application and what it means from all the way from sensors to data to processing? And I think the transformer load management is a is an excellent one, and it's one of many. So, but but yet what you have to do is look at every use case, and go through exactly that, the re requirements for the data, the requirements for processing, the requirements for the communication infrastructure, and see how they all, all combine to what the overall requirements are. So great, great job. With that, let's get uh, another utility perspective from Scott Hickson from Ameren, and Ameren is looking at the future grid vision at Ameren and uh, where does edge intelligence fit into that? Hello everyone, happy to be here and uh, some great points made by previous speakers and i um, glad to join you. So I'm Scott Hickson, I'm Grid of the Future and Analytics Solution Manager at Ameren. So uh, I'll be picking up on some of the points that the prior uh, presenters made, hopefully expand a little bit and then I'll be kicking it back to Mark and we'll take some questions from there. So uh, let's dive into it a little bit. So as we talk about AI, what we're really talking about is making decisions and taking actions. So when you think about taking, making a decision, you need to sense what's going on, you need to process that information, and then you need to take action. And underlying all of that is communication. And communication can be a limiting factor, and it's one of the big drivers for AI, especially at the edge. So uh, between sensing, processing, and taking action, communication underlies all of that. And the performance of that communication, one of the ways to measure that is in terms of latency. So latency, uh, to break this down, is picture you're in a room with somebody and you're exchanging hellos. You're going to have a very natural back and forth that's going to go very quickly. Now picture a situation that you may have been in recently where you're in a video chat with somebody on the other side of the world. You say hello, there's an awkward pause. They say hello, another awkward pause. That is an expression of high latency. 
So what you see on the screen right now is uh, a timeline in the middle. So we're going from nanoseconds to hours on the right hand side. And above that, within those boxes are grid events and actions that are currently taking place on our grid. And those line up with the time domain. So nanoseconds to milliseconds and also on the left hand side and minutes to hours on the right hand side. So as we think about latency and how that can impact our ability to make decisions, uh, let's go back to the example of saying hello again. So, but in this instance, let's think about two computers saying hello to each other to measure latency. And let's talk about that in reference to the grid events. So when two computers do that to each other, it's called a ping. So let's think about the best possible ping and lowest latency we could get. So let's think about that in terms of a data center. So two computers within the same data center highly optimize everything for great communications within there. You're looking at 500 uh, microseconds for just those two computers to say hi to each other. Now, if it's two random computers on the general internet, you're looking at 20 to about 100 milliseconds. And those two time domains that I mentioned there for those pings, those are represented by those black arrows on the under underside of that time scale. So now put those in reference of the grid events and grid actions that are taking place up there. And if we put those in context, you're really seeing that latency is going to be a huge challenge just within communications and trying to utilize a central AI approach. And that communication and the latency of that communication is going to wipe off a lot of uh, grid analytics use cases in AI that could help with that to address some of the problems and challenges that we're going to experience. So Edge AI will be able to help us with that. Another challenge, which some of the speakers uh, before me had mentioned, was just data volumes. So sensors are exploding everywhere in our world, and they're going to continue to grow. And our ability to extract value from those is going to become more and more important. But let's try and put the size of this data into perspective. Uh, so 100,000 sensors, which really isn't that high, it's, it's quite a small amount, but those 100,000 sensors are measuring at 100 kilohertz, that's going to be generating 4.4 exabytes of data, which is a gigantic amount of data. So as the grid matures, that volume of data is going to continue to grow at an incredible pace. It's going to go up and up and up. Certain situations, it's going to make sense to stream this data back to a central location, analyze it, and try and make some decisions based off of it. But there's going to be a, a large amount of grid analytic opportunities out there that we won't have that luxury of being able to do that. And also, it won't be required. So there's going to be opportunities for local high sensing, high frequency sensors with compute built in and readily available so that that data is not going to be, have to be packed back and forth. And it's going to open up a lot of opportunities. And one of those opportunities uh, that was mentioned earlier uh, was high frequency sensor within your AMI meter. So let's say that instead of taking measurements every five minutes to 15 minutes, think about the opportunities that could be there if you were measuring at 100 kilohertz. So you couldn't pass that amount of data back. So uh, think about the things you could do with that. Determining topology, load disaggregation, load forecasting. But there's a lot of challenges there. And there's opportunities with various approaches with regards to AI at the edge. So one approach that uh, was mentioned earlier was federated learning. And to make an uh, analogy which people may be familiar with, so your keyboard on your phone, as you're trying to type a word on your phone, your phone's trying to predict what that word's going to be based off of your keystrokes. So what's going on there is your phone is running a model locally that was provided to it by Google, and you are training that model to better predict the words that you're making and trying to type. So picture having that capability and that functionality within your AMI meter, where we have these customized models on a 
per customer basis and the insights that we're going to be able to draw. And not only on a per customer basis, but a, on a per location on the grid basis as well. So if we're trying to draw insights on the grid and customer behavior, it's going to open up an enormous amount of opportunities. And grid AI is going to allow us to pass models back and forth as opposed to raw data itself. So to uh, further expand on what are some specific use cases that we could talk about. So energy disaggregation, if we have a AMI meter measuring at 100 kilohertz with a custom model that is tweaked and tuned to that specific household, you're going to be able to do things, tremendous amount of things for low disaggregation. You're going to be able to sense when that customer's garage door opens. You're going to be able to absolutely sense when their EVs plugged in and when their solar's uh, producing and what it's not producing, the, the quality of that inverter for that solar, when their washer machine is running and when their thermostat and AC is running. So that's going to be a custom model for that customer. So uh, if we start to play this out, okay, well, well what then? Uh, well, if we know what devices that customer has and we know that they are have particular patterns. So let's say that the customer's a hardworking Uber driver. They know when the concerts are, they know when the ball games are, they know when all the big events are. So their patterns, when they come home from their house, they open the garage door, they walk in, they plug their car in because they need that car charged. Time of use couldn't mean anything to them. They need that car charged right then. They then go into their house, they adjust the temperature to a comfortable temperature, and then they start a load of laundry. Every time that customer comes home, that's their pattern. So if we have a custom model for that customer, we're gonna be able to produce more accurate forecasts about what that customer's load's gonna be. And to throw it back to what Brian was mentioning earlier, we can feed that back into uh, TLM for transformer load management. We could feed it back into load forecasting models for an entire feeder or section of feeder. And we can have that meter not just reporting back its actual usage, but we can have it reporting back its five minute, 15 minute and one hour forecast that they can be aggregated up for better load management. So there's a lot of great opportunities out there for edge AI uh, to reduce the amount of data that's being passed back and forth and also to tackle problems that wouldn't be available due to latency concerns or any other concerns. So uh, from here, I'll kick it back to uh, Mark and uh, uh, thank you all for your time. Looking forward to some questions. Great stuff, Scott. And uh, wow, and I think there's an obvious, there's a bunch of questions that, that are here, but I think uh, that last discussion raises a question that, that we really do need to talk about, and that is one around data privacy. And, you know, as we deployed AMI the first time around, a lot of people were against it. And, uh, you know, data privacy had something to do with that. Let's, uh, let's throw that out there for, and, and I think uh, obviously establishing the benefits for the customer of having that intelligence at the edge in terms of applications that can help them, whether it's equipment diagnostics and knowing when your air conditioner is about to fail so that you can repair it ahead of time or your electric vehicle charger from that same data that's helping us manage the grid. To, but the perception of you know the ability for you to have a digital twin of the customer that you really know everything that's going on there, it can be a little bit disturbing. How are we addressing that from a utility point of view? And then I'll throw it back to Prith Paul and, and uh, Mark to, from a technology point of view. What can we do to ease the minds of customers or to protect their data and still realize the benefits of these applications? Let me just throw that to all four of you because it's one that always comes up and I think it's worth discussing. Maybe Scott, since you were the last one to go, we'll come right back to you since the application you're describing is like beaming at you, like, you know, you know too much about yeah. me. Yeah, and privacy is a huge, huge concern because in the example I gave, do you want someone knowing that you're opening your garage door? 
Do you want anyone outside of your household knowing that? Maybe your security company in your utility, should they know that? Uh, well, maybe they don't need to know that. Maybe that data just needs to reside in the meter. And that's one of the great things about that approach that I mentioned earlier is that with a federated learning approach, that data is not being passed back to the utility. That data is lying within the meter, identifying that action, and then the only information being passed back to the utility are things that we need to know about, like what's going to be your load that in five minutes, what's going to be a load in 15 minutes, what's going to be your load in your hour. So there are ways to do this. Uh, there's uh, something called differential privacy, which is a technique you can use to protect people's privacy while doing all sorts of AI and ML opportunities. And I think uh, federated learning also offers a great approach. Great. Brian, anything to add from a utility perspective there before we give uh, Mark and Perth Paul a chance there? As Excel has been thinking about uh, edge processing, we really want to provide some value on the meter to the customer. And so we're looking at not only grid facing uh, use cases, but customer facing ones that add some value that would attract the customer to wanting to have to subscribe to, to, to have that insight. Um, but, but it's very real. Uh, if the customer, if there's some value of privacy to the fact that they have certain types of pumps, and yet it can be very valuable to the utility and our energy efficiency suggestions to know that they have pumps, that's a, a, a balance we have to walk. So we need to walk together with, uh, with our regulators and, and, uh, and demonstrating that we have the, the skills and the drive to keep that data private. Um, and I think that differential privacy that I just mentioned, I think is, is something that we'll need to uh, all be considering how we do that. Great stuff. Uh, Prith Paul, from an architecture point of view, um, managing this data privacy issues, any thoughts there? Yeah, I think, Mark, uh, we can look at it two different angles. You know, if we can, what I see is that if we can take it to as a low desegregation at the feeder level, okay, if the smart meters today, they can get anonymously low data. Today, they just send all the information to the utilities control center. Okay? But if they have a capability to pass that information to whatever means to the substation about the voltage and, and variable. So at, at, at the time you get a, like there are 3000 customers on a feeder, just for example, depending upon the utility. So if we can get the data on a feeder and then we are start running that analytics at the substation and what we call it a load desegregation. And that way we don't have to worry about the individual's information because it's just a voltage data and no individual details. And using that, we can desegregate various load characteristics when the EV is being, how much power is being generated by the solar, how much EV is being charged in storage and all those variables and then help utilities make a better decision from the load forecasting pers perspective and maximize the utilization of renewables at the edge of the grid. So that can be another perspective it can be handled versus trying to take the data or a individual specific information to a central location and then trying to interpolate to get uh, the intelligence out of it. So there's another way to look at it and maybe that's that's the area we need to explore. There's not that much work being done uh, in that area, but I think that uh, will be a good area to explore and build what I call it a edge ADMS, okay? And which will look at the behavior of the feeder and optimize like a seesaw, continuously op keep optimizing it so that, that's kind of my thoughts from the technology perspective to look from a different angle. Yeah, appreciate that, Mark. So um, I, I think there's going to be capabilities at the meter level to do a lot of this modeling, similar to cell phones. As, as I mentioned earlier, cell phones are very powerful, right? And so a lot of applications actually push the model down to the phone and that's where the data stays and they send updates or weightings of that model back to a centralized location. And they're doing that in healthcare today. There's probably nothing more sacred than healthcare data, right? And the HIPAA laws and everything else prevent sharing of data or personal health data 
being from shared or uh, moved from outside of a hospital or a research institution or other things. And electrical data, uh, as Brian mentioned, is, is, is similar, right? It, it, you know, people have to make a decision to opt in or opt out of sharing that data for a broader use. And so training the models actually at the smart meter and using federated learning, I think is a great approach because the data never leaves and you're just uh, leveraging the outcomes of an upgraded model, but then you can give incentives. And I think this is where people are gonna have to look at commercial models to customers to actually make concessions, right? When power gets difficult or when there's a storm and things go down and can you use your EV to charge your neighborhood or provide power to your neighbors? And those are all things that, that are gonna be possible um, but you have to have the meter to meter communications and you have to have uh, the right incentives for people to opt into that. Yeah, and I think that goes back to uh, some of Brian's comments about creating the value proposition for customers and then having regulatory structures that that, you know, allow us to to offer those those incentives and those those value propositions. And that will will definitely be part of the equation. I think I'd like to uh, go on to a topic of interoperability, which Mark raised in terms of creating kind of open platforms that people can build on for an innovation point of view. And maybe I'll start with Brian and Scott in terms of what you're seeing in this space, whether we're going to buy systems from folks that are what I call proprietary, or are you seeing a, a trend towards open platforms that would would really allow um innovation of other you know new applications and and startups and and uh you know i, I like to use the unleash the innovation term i'm a big fan of myself uh, around open systems and even open source but at least standards and 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 open approaches that that we can can uh offer for innovators to build on are you seeing that um in that direction or or right now are we kind of buying a solution and you got to build off of that brian i'll, I'll go first and uh, just say that we also subscribe to the concept of uh, the open source when possible always standards based we want to ensure that we have uh, a good you know that we're future proofing in such a way that we have the ability to plug in new and different uh, elements there um, but it's it's a nascent market right now, and that's not always available. So at least at some of the early, early foyers, utilities will need to, to walk down the path in using some equipment that's uh, more proprietary, but uh, you know with some protocols, et cetera. But always looking forward to, to using uh, that which is more standards based. For instance, with our communication from our electric meter to our customers, uh, you know, we're using Wi-Fi, so it's the ubiquitous tech, uh, communication mean. And then we've decided that 2030.5 is a standard that we want to head toward. So those standards are going to be uh, critically important. Um, and uh, yeah, those are the thoughts I had. Appreciate that. Any uh, makes sense to you, Scott, or do you have any any additional to add to that? Yeah, I, I think the major points that I'll uh, add and just really kind of echo are that uh, there's good opportunities for utilities to collaborate and establish some platforms as well as uh, having some strategic partnerships with vendors as well. Uh, so one of the things that uh, is important to consider is, well, if you're going with the closed source system to solve whatever solution that you're trying to tackle, is that solution extensible? So uh, are you going to be boxed into the current uh, functionality and capabilities of that system? Or, or are you going to be able to extend that to the next logical step or evolution to meet a solution and solve a problem that you're trying that, that's next up? Are you gonna have to wait or are you gonna have to wait to the next major release, which can be a huge issue. So uh, I think having open common standards is a huge, foundational item that needs to be addressed. And then also whether uh, whatever the solution is, I think its ability to be extensible to solve problems that are specific to that utility are also 
It's also quite important. From a uh, technology point of view, Mark, you kind of got me going in, in this direction. Is do you see uh, the open systems approach as as a legitimate you know business opportunity from a technology point of view that that you know providing that that platform or building applications on that it seems like it's kind of a little bit of both directions when you have open systems you lose some proprietary aspects that you could be have commercial value but maybe uh raise the whole level for everyone well that, that i think your point is exactly right you know it it's how do we elevate the entire industry um that, that's really what's going to be important here for grid resiliency and the faster adoption of um, renewables and alternative energy sources, right, is, is to make sure that uh, the, the grid can, can consume those and can bring value to the end consumer and still make it uh, reduce the impact to utilities in dealing with these distributed energy resources. And, and having an open platform where the industry can collaborate with big, with big tech companies like NVIDIA and Intel and others to basically help to build the backend software stack um, and then leverage so many startup companies across, across the world, right? Uh, startup organizations are now becoming uh, the R&D for major companies, right? We, we see so many more companies with venture arms that are making investments in startups because they can be more agile and do more development than they can do internally. And having a common platform that they can all develop on top of and get access to data um, in, in a common design will be important because the last thing you want is different support platforms or different things that plug into the grid to be making decisions in isolation, right? Having a common platform that somebody can choose, a utility can choose what's the most important thing so that you don't have one device grabbing control over another device for those things um, will be really important. But I think as an industry, we can work together and solve those problems uh, quickly. Great, great. I think uh, we had a, a lot of great discussion around kind of next generation advanced meters with intelligence at the edge. And, um, you know, I know here in Europe, NL is already deploying, you know, generation two of their advanced meters since they were one of the first ones to deploy advanced metering in the industry. How are we going to kind of decide on the requirement set and and uh, and deploy it. How do we get started in that direction? And Brian, you guys are really seem like you're far along in the thinking around what you'd like to see in a, in a next generation advanced meter. What would be the plan for kind of getting started on that and and the vision for kind of the length of time it would take to to implement a next generation advanced metering that has these capabilities? How many iterations are we going to have to go through? Well, fortunately, there's an awful lot of knowledge already out in the industry, and there are vendors that are uh, aggressively moving into this space to have that capability on their meters. They're vying for uh, position, how much processing power, how much memory, what type of processor is, is placed on the meter. And so they're, they're actively looking to help utilities future-proof. So that's really reducing the time considerably. Excel started down the path without actually contemplating uh, the edge processing, and we uh, were partway down our path towards AMI selection when we uh, when we um, seriously considered it and modified our specifications. Uh, so I think what's really helpful now is for other utilities as they look forward to the future, um, they're going to be talking with vendors that are anxious to help them in this state in this state. But as far as time frame. It's a, it's a long time and with the multi-state utilities in particularly, uh, the regulatory um, processes uh, can take a long time. Uh, so it depends on the utility specifically, of course, and of course some co-ops and such can operate much faster. So it can be in the, in the order of a couple of years to something significantly longer. In our case, it, it was longer than that, of course. And then of course, uh, deployment is, is a time 
consuming element. Uh, and actually labor becomes important and then chip supply becomes important because we're talking about a lot of different devices at the end. And if there was one part, the, a point that I'd like to augment with Mark is that uh, we need to maximize the sensors that are out there in the field. Uh, there's, and as much as we can do disaggregation and other things with these sensors, we need to be able to leverage all those that we have so that we don't simply invest in more sensors than we need, but we truly are maximizing that which is installed. And that's that's partly the communication network to to, to do that and, and take advantage of that. Let me do this. We're down to inside the last five minutes. I'd like to have each panelist uh, kind of give a perspective and the two utility panelists, the perspective I'd like to, to hear is what can a utility do to get started going down this path of distributed intelligence? Maybe one or two things. And from the from Prith Paul and, and Mark, what would you advice would you give to startup companies and new technology providers that want to provide applications? What maybe what one or two um, applications or or opportunities would you see? Would you recommend they? That, that they that they go after given this this uh, need for distributed intelligence and I'll start with the utilities and we'll go back to the technology providers Scott and yeah. what, what can you do to get started well it, it, I'll go with the approach of uh, crawl walk run so uh, think about where utility is right now with utilizing your data that you have available. So uh, the point that Brian made was a phenomenal point in that we have tremendous amounts of data available to us right now that we need to basically learn how to work with, learn how to process, learn how to extract value from. I, I think that's kind of one of your big first steps. Uh, I think another important point that uh, I think it'd be good to bring up is the realm of cybersecurity in that uh, security and cybersecurity has to be paramount, it has to be proved out. This is something that we haven't spent much time talking about during the session, but I saw one of the questions come in through the question screen is uh, in your question that you were posing to uh, our industrial partners is, what does the startup need to do? So a startup, one of your key things that if you can distinguish yourself with is that your cybersecurity and that you have a hard and secure solution, that's going to be a big distinguishing factor. And it's going to also enable you to get your toehold within utilities a lot faster, because as we start talking about making decisions at the edge, cybersecurity is a huge concern. Uh, just think about all the avenues of attack that are available for edge AI, whether it's time spoofing by a GPS signal, or maybe you're introducing a, a minor harmonic that could wreak havoc on the grid via some smart inverter. There's a lot of risk there. And I think that's going to be one of the big barriers for this moving forward in utilities is the cyber concerns. Really appreciate that, Scott, and, and hitting on an absolutely critical topic right on target. Brian? Two things, vision from the leadership. And second is education of everybody. Uh, if, if the people don't know the terminology and how AI works, how machine learning works, it's going to be really hard for them to, to uh, see the vision of how it can be used to their advantage. Beautiful. Thanks a lot. Uh, we'll go backwards and uh, go to Mark first. So uh, from a startup perspective, I would encourage companies to solve problems that, that are challenging and that are not necessarily focused on what today today's meters or today's AMIs can solve. Uh, creating an app for a, an iPhone 8 isn't valuable. You know, what we have to do is think about what the future holds and the complexity that's in front of us and start to solve those problems. And, and that's where I'd say focus on one thing there's no technology companies big enough to do everything. And that's why building an ecosystem that can run on the same platform is going to be critical because otherwise we're only going to get three applications and not the 30 that we need to solve the resiliency issues that we face. Chris Paul, you get the last 20 seconds. 
Oh, th thank you, Mark. I think the key is the software defined infrastructure. Once we disconnect hardware from the software, then possibilities are infinite. As, as Mark mentioned, that we can create as much as application which solve the needs of the utilities. I think that is what the future needs to focus on uh, build, building the infrastructure which is scalable, reliable, secure, and gives that flexibility to utilities add more applications going forward. I want to thank all four of you guys for a dynamite session. Really enjoyed the discussion and uh, I think it'd be a really valuable contribution to the industry. Thanks a lot and uh, look forward to the rest of the summit. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mark. I have to say, I'd never really heard of Edge AI until this past year, but the potential here that these solutions can lend themselves to in reducing uh, grid network connect, uh, congestion, enabling faster and more efficient operations, putting the data to work, um, I think left our audience with some great insights to consider for their own deployment opportunities. All right, we are headed into our second break and we have another quick video for you. This one focuses on enabling technology to unlock the full potential of text-based data with a natural language processing dictionary that's uh, going to enable uh, AI tools to create efficiencies, first for nuclear operators and eventually the entire uh, electric power industry. I will see you in 30 minutes and enjoy this video.